Attitudes are the complexes of beliefs and feelings that people have about specific ideas, situations, or other people. Attitudes are important because they're a mechanism through which most people express their feelings. Attitudes are usually viewed as stable dispositions to behave towards objects in a certain way. As illustrated here, attitudes contain three components, cognition, effect, and behavioral intention. Attitudes are generally formed around a sequence of cognition, effect, and behavioral intention. That is, when we come to know something that we believe to be true, cognition, this knowledge triggers a feeling, affect. Cognition and affect then together influence how we tend to behave towards a particular situation in the future. Cognition is the knowledge a person presumes to have about something. A person's affect is his or her feelings towards something. In many ways, affect is similar to emotion. It's something over which we have little or no conscious control. Intention guides a person's behavior. Intentions are not always translated into actual behavior, however. Affect, cognition, and behavioral intention are the primary components of an attitude. Attitudes are general evaluation of objects, ideas, and people one encounters throughout one's life. Likewise, if the object of an attitude changes, a person's attitude towards that object may also change. Attitudes can also change when the object of the attitude becomes less important or less relevant to the person. Deeply rooted attitudes that have a long history are, of course, resistant to change. Attitude change occurs any time an attitude is modified. Thus, change occurs when a person goes from being positive to negative, from slightly positive to very positive, or from having no attitude to having one. Of course, some of these attitudes are more important than others. Especially important attitudes are job satisfaction, organizational commitment, and employee engagement. Job satisfaction is one of the most commonly studied organizational outcomes in the field of organizational behavior. Our job satisfaction reflects our attitudes and feelings about our job. The factors that have the greatest influence on job satisfaction are the work itself, attitudes, values, and personality. Are happy employees really more productive employees? The answer is yes. And the positive relationship between job satisfaction and job performance is even stronger for complex professional jobs. Satisfied employees also benefit organizations because job satisfaction positively influences employees' attitudes and organizational citizenship behaviors. Organizational commitment reflects the degree to which an employee identifies with the organization and its goals and wants to stay with the organization. There are three ways we can feel committed to an employer. Effective commitment, which is a positive emotional attachment to the organization and strong identification with its values and goals. Normative commitment, which is a feeling of obligation to stay with an organization for moral or ethical reasons. And continuance commitment, staying with an organization because of a perceived high economic or social costs with leaving. When we feel respected and see how others matter to the organization and to others, we are more enthusiastic and engaged. Engaged employees give their full effort to their jobs, often going above and beyond what's required because they're passionate about the organization and doing their jobs well. While disengaged workers do not perform close to their potential capabilities, lacking the emotional and motivational connections to their employer that drive discretionary effort. Engagement is enhanced when employees have the resources they need to do a great job, get meaningful feedback on their performance, are able to use their talents, and are recognized for doing a good job, as well as having opportunities to learn and grow. Employee engagement is a heightened connection that the employee has with their job and the organization. Values are ways of behaving or end states that are desirable to a person or to a group. Values can be conscious or unconscious. Work values influence important individual and organizational outcomes, including performance and retention, and are often considered to be important work outcomes themselves. An organizational leader's personal values affect the firm's business strategy in all aspects of organizational behavior, including staffing, reward systems, manager-subordinate relationships, communication, conflict management styles, and negotiation approaches. Personal values also influence ethical choices. 
When there are no clear rules for dealing with specific ethical problems, we tend to respond to each situation on an individual basis, depending on our values at the time. Our personal values combined with organizational influences like company culture to generate decisions that can be significantly different from those that would be based solely on our personal values. Strong organizational cultures help guide us when making these ambiguous choices. However, if personal values conflict with organizational culture values, it's difficult to maintain ethical norms. Values can be described as terminal or instrumental, and as intrinsic or extrinsic. Let's explore these dimensions. One noted researcher identified two types of values, terminal and instrumental. Terminal values reflect our long-term life goals and may include prosperity, happiness, a sense of family, and a sense of accomplishment. Terminal values can change over time depending on our experiences and our accomplishments. Instrumental values are our preferred means for achieving our terminal values, our preferred ways of behaving, thinking, and feeling. Terminal values influence what we want to accomplish, while instrumental values influence how we get there. Honesty, ambition, and independence are examples of instrumental values that guide our behavior in pursuit of our terminal goals. The stronger the instrumental value is, the more we act on it. Intrinsic work values relate to the work itself. Most people need to find some personal intrinsic value in their work to feel truly satisfied with it. Valuing challenging work and learning new skills can advance your career. Extrinsic work values are related to the outcomes of doing work. Employees who work to earn money or to have health benefits are satisfying extrinsic work values. Having high status in the organization, getting recognized for quality work, and having job security are also extrinsic work values. Values impact organizational culture, performance, and outcomes. Employees who effectively manage their emotions and moods can create a competitive advantage for their organization. We all experience emotions at work. Our behaviors are not guided solely by conscious, rational thought. In fact, emotion often plays a larger role in our behaviors than does conscious reasoning. Emotions are intense, short-term, physiological, behavioral, and psychological reactions to a specific object, person, or event that prepare us to respond for it. Let's break down this definition into its four important elements. Emotions are short events or episodes. Emotions are likely short-lived. Excitement about making a big sale or anxiety over a looming deadline subsides after a little bit. Emotions are directed at something or someone. This differentiates emotions from moods, which are short-term emotional states that are not directed towards anything in particular. Moods are less intense than emotions and can change quickly. The cause of emotions can be readily identified, making a big sale or facing a deadline as an example. Emotions are experienced. They involve involuntary changes of heart rate, blood pressure, facial expressions, animation, and vocal tone. We feel emotion. Emotions create a state of physical readiness through physiological reactions. Increased heart rate, adrenaline, and eye movements prepare our bodies to take action. Particularly strong emotions including fear, anger, and surprise can demand our attention, interrupt our thoughts, and motivate us to respond by focusing our attention on whatever is generating the emotion. Whereas an attitude can be thought of as a judgment about something, an emotion is experienced or felt. Emotions do not last as long as attitudes. Emotions influence how we perceive the world, help us to interpret our experiences, and prime us to respond. Although the cause of emotions tend to be obvious, the cause of mood tends to be more unfocused and diffused. Moods are short-term emotional states that are not directed towards anything in particular. Unlike instant reactions that produce emotion and that change with the expectations of future pleasure or pain, moods are harder to cope with, can last for days, weeks, months, or even years. Our mood at the start of the workday influences how we see and react to work events and influences our performance. Because moods reflect an individual's emotional state, researchers typically infer the existence of moods from a variety of behavioral clues. 
At the end of the day, it's important to understand that moods play important roles in how we perform our jobs and how others perceive us. Perception is the set of processes by which an individual becomes aware and interprets information about the environment. If everyone perceived everything the same way, things would be a lot simpler. Of course, just the opposite is true. People perceive the same things in very different ways. Moreover, people often assume that reality is objective and that we all perceive the same things in the same way. Two basic perceptual processes are particularly relevant to managers, selective perception and stereotyping. Selective perception is the process of screening out information that we are uncomfortable with or that contradicts our beliefs. Stereotyping is categorizing or labeling people on the basis of a single attribute. Certain forms of stereotyping can be useful and efficient, however. As you might expect, errors may creep into how we interpret things that we perceive. Stereotyping and selection perception are often underlying causes of these errors, but other factors may also come into play. The halo effect is when we form general impressions about something or someone based on a single, typically good characteristic. The contrast effect occurs when we evaluate our own or another person's characteristics through comparisons with other people that we've recently encountered or who rank higher or lower on the same characteristics. Our impressions and expectations of others also become self-fulfilling prophecies. If we categorize a person as untrustworthy, we're likely to treat that individual with suspicion and distrust. These actions then evoke appropriate guarded reactions from the other person, whose reactions serve to confirm our initial impressions. One of the first experiments on the self-fulfilling prophecy effect in work settings was conducted in a job training program for disadvantaged employees. Attribution refers to the way we explain the causes of our own as well as other people's behaviors and achievements and understand why people do what they do. The strongest attribution people tend to make is whether their own or others' behaviors or outcomes are due to the individual because of things like effort or ability, or to the environment because things like luck, lack of resources, or other people. As shown here, we rely on three rules to evaluate whether to assign an internal or external attribution to someone's behavior or outcome. First is consistency. Has the person regularly behaved this way or experienced this outcome in the past? Next is distinctiveness. Does the person act the same way or receive similar outcomes in different types of situations? Low distinctiveness occurs when the person frequently acts in a certain way or receives certain outcomes and leads to internal attributions. Finally, consensus. Would others behave similarly in the same situation or receive the same outcome? A related aspect of attribution is self-handicapping. Self-handicapping occurs when people create obstacles for themselves that make success less likely. As a manager, understanding that a subordinate's own perceptions or attributions for success or failure determine the amount of effort that he or she will expend on that activity in the future is a powerful motivational tool. The term organizational fairness refers to employees' perceptions of organizational events, policies, and practices as being fair or not fair. Why should you care about fairness? You should care because perceptions of fairness affect a wide variety of employee attitudes and behaviors, including satisfaction, commitment, trust, and turnover. A number of negative behaviors can result from perceptions of unfairness, including theft, sabotage, and other unethical behaviors. Perceived unfairness also increases the chances that employees will file lawsuits against their employers. Most of these outcomes of fairness perceptions can have an obvious economic impact on organizations. As a manager, it's critical to remember that it's insufficient to just be fair. You must also be perceived as fair by your subordinates. Perceptions are what drive responses, and subordinates' attributions and interpretations of your behavior and decisions may not reflect your intentions of your own beliefs. We think of fairness in three main ways. Let's take a look. Distributive fairness refers to the perceived fairness of the outcome received, including resource distributions, promotions, hiring and layoff decisions, and raises. 
Imagine that you and a friend both apply for a job with a local company at the same time. Although you believe you are more qualified, your friend is offered the job and you are not. Would that feel fair? Your belief about fairness of you not getting the job reflects your perception of distributive fairness. Distributive fairness relates only to the outcome received, not to the fairness of the process that generated the decision. A fair process is as important as a fair outcome. Procedural fairness addresses the fairness of the procedures or processes used to generate that outcome. What rules were followed, what people had the opportunity to express opinions and influence the outcome, and so on. Interactional fairness is whether or not the amount of information about the decision and the process was adequate, and the perceived fairness of the interpersonal treatment and explanations received during the decision-making process. Does an employee who did not receive a fair performance bonus feel that the supervisor adequately explained the reason? When we assess undesirable outcomes, how we are treated can be just as important as the outcomes we receive. It's difficult to give our best effort to someone who treats us rudely or disrespects us. Deception and abusive words or actions can be seen as having low interactional fairness. One of the most important outcomes of consistently treating others fairly is trust. Trust is the expectation that another person will not act to take advantage of us regardless of our ability to monitor or control them. Stress has been defined in many ways, but most definitions say that stress is caused by a stimulus, that the stimulus can be either physical or psychological, and that the individual responds to the stimulus in some way. Therefore, we define stress as a person's adaptive response to a stimulus that places excessive physiological or physical demands on him or her. Given the underlying complexities of this definition, we need to examine its components carefully. First is the notion of adaptation. People may adapt to stress in many of several ways. Second is the role of the stimulus, called the stressor. Third, stressors can be either physiological or physical. And finally, the demands of the stressors that placed on the individual must be excessive for the stress to actually result. Much of what we know about stress today can be traced to the pioneering work of Hans Seeley. This figure offers a graphical representation of the General Adaptation Syndrome, or GAS. According to this model, each of us have a normal level of resistance to stressful events. Some of us can tolerate a great deal of stress and others much less, but we all have a threshold at which stress affects us. The GAS begins when a person first encounters a stressor. The first stage is called alarm. At this point, a person may feel some degree of panic and begin to wonder how to cope. The individual may also have to resolve a fight-or-flight question. Can I deal with this, or should I run away? If the stressor is too extreme, the person may simply be unable to cope with it. In most cases, however, the individual gathers his or her strength, either physical or emotional, and begins to resist the negative effects of the stressor. Often, the resistance phase ends the GAS. On the other hand, prolonged exposure to the stressor without resolution may bring on the third phase of the GAS, which is exhaustion. At this stage, the person literally gives up and can no longer fight the stressor. Seeley also pointed out that the sources of stress need not all be bad. Let's take a look. For example, receiving a bonus and then having to decide what to do with the money can be stressful. So, getting a promotion, making a speech as part of winning a major award, getting married, or other similar good things can also be stressors. Of course, there's also a negative side to stress. Called distress, this is what most people think of when they hear the word stress. Excessive pressure, unreasonable demands on our time, and bad news all fall into this category. Let's take a look at the common causes of stress. Many things cause stress. Stress can be categorized into two broad general groups, organizational stressors and life stressors. It also has three categories of stress consequences, individual consequences, organizational consequences, and burnout. Organizational stressors are various factors in the workplace that can cause stress. Four general sets of organizational stressors are task demands, physical demands, role demands, and interpersonal demands. Stress can have a number of consequences. 
If the stress is positive, then the result might be more energy, enthusiasm, or motivation. Of more concern, of course, are the negative consequences of stress. The individual consequences of stress are the outcomes that mainly affect the individual. Stress may produce behavioral, psychological, and medical consequences. Any of the individual consequences just discussed can also affect the organization. Other results of stress have even more direct consequences for organization. These include declines in performance, withdrawal, and negative changes in attitudes. Burnout, another consequence of stress, has clear implications for both people and organizations. Burnout is the general feeling of exhaustion that develops when a person simultaneously experiences too much pressure and has too few sources of satisfaction. People with high aspirations and strong motivation to get things done are prime candidates for burnout under certain conditions. Given that stress is widespread and so potentially disruptive to organizations, it follows that people and organizations should be concerned about how to manage it more effectively. And in fact, they are. Many strategies have been developed to help managers with stress in the workplace. Some for individuals and others are geared towards the organization. Work-life effectiveness is a specific set of organizational practices, policies, and programs, plus a philosophy that actively supports efforts to help employees achieve success both at work and at home. Part of each person's life is also distinctively separate from work. These dimensions might include a person's spouse or life companion, dependents such as children or elderly parents, personal life interests, hobbies, leisure time interests, religious affiliations, community involvement, and friendship networks. Work-life relationships, then, include any relationships between dimensions of the person's work life and the person's personal life. Balancing work-life linkages, then, is of course not an easy thing to do. Demands from both sides can be extreme, and people may need to be prepared to make trade-offs. The important thing is to recognize the potential trade-offs in advance so that they can be carefully weighed and a comfortable decision can be made. People also have to decide for themselves what they value and what trade-offs they're willing to make to find work-life effectiveness.